Miss Mary. The right drink. Eat, drink, and be merry. <laughs> Eat, drink, and be, and be with we Mary. Can all be Miss <laughs> Mary. That's right. We strive to be Miss Mary. That's right. All right. You got your papers. We're going to pray, and then we're going to we're going to go into the service tonight. But look, it's important. This is this is a very crucial crucial moment that we live in because there. I mean, it's just like every time you think that you've just about got all the problems solved, here comes more. You think you'll top up? I mean, everywhere I just got through. When I, I think I found out why a couple years ago when I got so sick and they couldn't figure out what it was, I took the Tamiflu. And that's where I got sick. So this time I take the Tamiflu, my knees swell up like this. And I got, and he told me it's from the Tamiflu, so I'm taking more Tamiflu. And so I finally get my knees to the swellings going down, and then, and then today... I take Beth to the doctor, and she's got to have surgery because she has an umbilical hernia. And so it's like, it's just boom, 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 boom. You know, it's just constant. And everybody's life is like that. We're all like that. We're all, we all, it's just never, it's never ending. We just get hit more. No, 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 no. <laughs> Nobody gets hit more. Everybody gets hit hard. That's how it works. No, you just think you got hit more. <laughs> Before we get started, I want to share something I saw you on Dr. Oz. Okay. I don't know if y'all watch him or not, whether you like it or not. But there was two doctors on there. One of them's a neurosurgeon, one of them's an orthopedic surgeon. Uh -huh. That had died and gone to heaven and come back. The lady was underwater for 45 minutes. Wow. And she saw the EMTs working on her. Heard them say, well, she's dead. She's been without air for 45 minutes. She's dead. She was taken to heaven. She was treated the best she'd ever been treated in her life. Angels around her protecting her. She hated to leave, but angels finally told her, said, you're not, it's not your time yet. Just come back. But the neurosurgeon, it was a guy, he woke up one morning uh, sick as a dog, and he died, and his body left, and he went up to a field of butterfly, of uh, angel butterfly wings on it. What? The spirit. The spirit left him in. He said, there was this beautiful girl, butterfly, with butterfly wings on, prettiest girl he'd ever seen in his life, and took and introduced him to everybody into the kingdom, and just bright and beautiful building and all. Well, she told him, it's not your time yet, so he came back to and he was telling his sister and his family about it. And his sister said, he had a sister he had never seen that had died before he was born. She got a picture of it and showed it to him. And he said, that's her. That was the angel with butterfly wings that had me in heaven. Wow. And Dr. Oz was in awe about this. He said, here are two doctors that are actually taught not to believe in death and going to heaven and coming back. And here they are professing it here. And these two doctors are treating their patients that are, have had the same experience on there. Well, but that proves right there that, that God uses you for something. He's using oh, these yeah. two doctors right there. Yes. Because they had seen heaven, and it's a real place. And they're proclaiming it like crazy. But they share some of many. It was just, it, I sat there in amazement, especially with Dr. Ron said, tell me more, tell me more. He just wanted to hear everything about what's going on there. But, it was totally amazing. Jean said that lady, she's got I, a book. I've read that book, and, that lady brought it. Somebody had told me and Linda the other day that angels <laughs> didn't have wings. Who told you that? You remember. Well, the Bible says it do. They do. I, mean, I, I got some right here. Look, look at my <laughs> head. <laughs> They're just invisible. I got a couple, sure I got a couple of wings so covered up my horns. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought that was amazing that two professionals that got all these PhDs and all that behind them would get up and proclaim that much for God. That's awesome. It, it is. That's it's, awesome. It's that, that was a good that, that, word. That, 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 Isaiah chapter 6. Right. That's right. That, 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 that could hurt their profession. Yeah. 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 That's, that's, that's Isaiah right. chapter 6 says the angels go, they go around the throne crying, holy, 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 24-7. They have two wings that cover their eyes, and they have two wings which or they cover their hands, and they fly, but they got two covering their feet. They got six wings. That's a lot of wings. And, and of course, some of the stuff we see is what we're thinking of. It's like, it's like the other day I was at a Chinese, a Chinese restaurant in Chocolate Wind, and he said, I said, some of the best Chinese food. And he said, <laughs> if you had real Chinese food, he said, you probably couldn't eat it. He said, this is Americanized Chinese food. So we, we got all this stuff that we've Americanized or personalized ourselves, but we can see how God see it, sees it. It would be a whole lot different, and we would, we would have a whole different attitude about a whole lot of things. Here we are. Everybody's got a paper, right? Mm -hmm. Let's first, first let's go to the Lord of Prayer. And we, there are more papers up there, and we got ink pens. Uh, I want you to study and ask questions. It's okay to ask questions. And the only, the only stupid question is one that you did not ask. Okay? That's the only one. So, so don't ever think your, your question is too stupid to ask. 
I should be playing for Duke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I didn't even look right. It's just like that. Okay. <clears throat> okay, yeah. <sighs> yeah, I used to could dunk a basketball. When I coached when I coached basketball in Aurora, I could actually I could dunk it. And now I can't even touch the net. Matter of fact, I can barely even <laughs> I'm, yeah. Yeah. Praise God. What I have discovered is the older I get, the better I was. <laughs> I really Father, we love you, we praise your name, we thank you for your your this house, Lord, and this chance to be together to learn about what you want us to know about in our lives, Father, to know uh, when problems come, Lord, that you're there with us and that you're going to handle them. I ask you right now, Lord, to bless everybody that's here, open their hearts, open their minds, open their spirits. In the name of Jesus, we thank you for healing and we thank you for calling and we thank you, God, for restoration. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Now, now, we had assignments last week. How many has done their assignment last week? Well, we yeah, yeah, we had we had an assignment this week, and I'm gonna go. I'm gonna read over the very first part of this. Wait a minute. I was out of school. I quit. Look, I didn't do no more assignments. In the very first top of this is the three the three myths that we went over last week. I'm gonna go over with us tonight, just so we can go into our. Okay. How, how many's ever thought this way? Y'all that might have been here last week. How many would ever th has ever thought this way? When you face a problem. Uh, Everybody faces problems. Everybody. Y'all say everybody. everybody. Everybody faces problems. And even the person you think has got it made is facing everybody. problems. Uh, but you can let it defeat you or you can let it develop you. And the choice is yours, not the problems. It's your, it's your decision. I can let it defeat me or I can let it develop me. So, so I choose to let problems develop me. And, and think about this too. Uh, uh, photos are developed in a dark room. Sometimes we're being developed. It's dark. But know that we're being developed, that God's doing something. So first, the first myth, I got mixed up last week. I thought I was talking about the truth. It's a myth. The first myth, and we've all thought this, and I hope you're not thinking now, but if you are, I hope that this changes your mind. Ignore my problem, and it'll go away. You can't. You cannot ignore your problem, and it'll go away. Because... Because that problem you may ignore, it's like a cancer. You can ignore that cancer, and it's going to eat away to the point where you could have had minor surgery to take care of it, and instead it takes you out of here. Okay? Uh, so, uh, John 16, says, These things have I spoken to you, that in me you might have peace. In this world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I'm overcome the world. Second myth. I can do nothing about my problems. I'm helpless. That is a misnomer also because you can always do something about your problems. Always. It may not be earth shattering. It may not be uh, automatic fix everything. But you can always do something about your problems. You're never just stuck. Myth number three. Time will heal all wounds. Time does not heal all wounds. How many ever said? How many ever said practice makes perfect? Mm -hmm. Guess what? Practice does not make perfect. Practice makes permanent. If I keep doing it the wrong way constantly, then all I've done is made it permanent. Continually doing it the correct way makes it perfect. But just practice by itself does not make it perfect. It makes it permanent. So here, here's those three myths. And, and I actually uh, I ask if anybody wanted to speak tonight about the... Go ahead. Tell us, tell, us, tell us what the assignment was and tell us what your answers are. Okay. I, this is how I took... What it said. No, everybody else can take it their way. But your question was to, to look at the one. Have you ever you ever paid for the same mistake twice? Do do we pay for the same mistake twice? Well, at first I didn't really think that much about it. So I went away and I didn't pay attention to it. Then I kept coming back. And I kept, three times I came back. So then I decided, okay, and this is what I wrote down. And I have no idea if this is what you meant. But this is what I got from it. I have made the same mistake twice, maybe three times, four times, whatever. And when I do, and I realize I've made this mistake this many times, I lose patience with myself. Mm -hmm. It causes anger, it causes frustration, and it questions my judgment. Now, I don't really know how you... That's you, good. 
but good. I mean, it, it's within me. Why That's awesome. That's this? a good answer. And I really believe that I can think later on that God told me to do it, but really in truth, I really don't think I asked him at the beginning. Right. It's easier to see it later on down the road. I should have really got it clear. Hindsight's twenty twenty. So, Always. and that's Always. why I think I just get so activated. <clears throat> okay, that's good. Anybody else? That was awesome. That was absolutely awesome. I'm gonna say yes. I made a mistake twice, <clears throat> but. Over the years, I have, before I do anything, or anything special that's involved the whole family, I pray to the good Lord about it. And I'll wait at least a day or two. And my answer is, yes, I have made that mistake, but now I put my trust in God and get my answers from Him. That's good. Anybody else? You ever made the same mistake twice and learned from it eventually and quit making it? See, see, see if, you, if you do it twice, let me tell you something. You can say that was a mistake or you can say that was a lesson. If you learned from it, it was a lesson. If you just keep making it over again, yes, a mistake. It's just pitiful. Uh, I've, seen people, I've seen people do things over and know that it's not going to work and just keep on doing it. Mm -hmm. Because, like I was talking about Sunday morning when I got lost and so I just sped up and Linda said, but well, you know where you're going? No. She said, well, why are you going? So why did you speed up? I said, well, I don't know where I'm going, but at least I'm making good time. <laughs> you know, you don't, making the same mistake twice, you don't have to do that. You can actually, the Holy Spirit will guide you. Plus, you have enough people around you that's been there and done that. You can ask them. It's okay to ask people. Don't be afraid not, don't be afraid to ask people, what do you think about things? Because the day and time that you get, you feel like you don't have to ask anybody, then it's a bit day and time that, that pride will take over. That's what we're talking about Sunday morning. Pride will take over, and and, and here comes the fall. So, I, I think this makes us more aware of it now, David. If, if, if we do make a mistake, we, we, we'll stop now and think, am I going to make the same mistake twice? Since it's been brought out into the open, that it's a habit people do. It's making the, the same mistake over and over. Oh, yeah. You know, a lot of times. Yeah, there was a guy in the, in the doctor's office, and he had two big old band-aids on one on each ear. Mm -hmm. And the guy beside him said, what happened? He said, well, I was at home. My wife was complaining about housework, how hard it was, and blah, 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 blah. And I told her it was a piece of cake. Why is she even complaining? And she said, well, I got ironing to do. So I'll take care of it. You go on. I got this. And so, so I had the ironing board sitting by my reclining chair. He said, I had my remote control sitting up there, and I had my telephone sitting up there. I was reading the paper, watching ESPN, the game, and I was ironing at the same time. And he said, well, why in two years? He said, well, he said, somebody called me. And then when I went to try to pick up, instead of picking up the phone, I picked up the iron and stuck it right into my head. Is that true? And yeah, he said, he said, well, that explains that side. What about this side? He said, that idiot called back. <laughs> I'm a comedy, though. <laughs> okay. Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> right. But it's such a good example. Yes, it is. It is a great yes. example. Yes. Yeah, we do it all the time. Okay, so let's, let's go ahead and go into uh, uh, this week's. There's, right, there's five. I'm going to do two to that night. But I do want to read these little, these little, little short stuff between here. It says, The truth is proper handling through time has the potential to heal wounds. It's possible to lengthen or shorten the time you spend suspended by the problem, or you can refuse healing altogether. And then here it is. Have you ever paid for the same mistake twice? Yes, I have. All right. Uh, uh, have you ever failed to see how God wants to use your problems for good in your life? We're so busy complaining... And we're trying to pray away what God is actually letting come to us to, to, to teach us. And so if he's, all, if, he's, if he's bringing it on so you can learn and you keep pushing it away, then how are you going to learn? You know, uh, I remember as a football coach, it hurt me to watch those youngers hit each other so hard. You know, and it hurt to watch those guys, you know, I see them with tears in their eyes and D.C. with tears in their eyes and Daniel. But I know that if they didn't practice hard, and if I weren't there in practice, I couldn't be with them on the field when they played the game. And so my responsibility was to, was to toughen them up in the practice so when they got in the game, 
I was on the sideline, then I could then we could come, we could tell them what to do, but we couldn't be out there with them. And so God does the same thing. He prepares us in everyday life so when the problems come, we're not so taken by surprise and we're not so beat up by them. We can keep moving forward. So uh, here we go. Here are the five ways. There's only two tonight. Number one, God uses your problems, yours. Somebody say mine. My problem. problem. God uses your problem to direct you. To direct you. Now think about it. Once you think about this, I've got some scripture I want to go with you, but once you think about it, sometimes God has to light a fire around us to get us moving. Do you know I would not have gotten in church if I had not come to a strong decision point in my life? Once I got that decision point in my life, and it had to do with my job, and it had to do with, with, with a whole lot of things. I was, I was getting ready to go in the wrong direction. I was getting ready to get it with the wrong people. Plus, my job, they were demanding something of me that I didn't know if I could even do it, and, and blah, blah, blah. And, and so I was at such a crucial point in my life. Plus, my D.C. hadn't been born yet. It was just about time for D.C. to be born. And so during all of this, I, it drove me to my knees, and I began to talk to God. And that's when I wound up in church. And, and if it hadn't been for all that stuff going on, then obviously uh, uh, things would have gotten really, really bad. And I probably would not even have uh, kept my job and I would not have kept my marriage. But because of that, things got, things got in the right direction and God got the glory. Problems often point us to the new direction and they motivate us to change. As long as everything's going good, a lot of times, why do we want to change? If everything's hunky-dory, why do, why do I need God if everything's going fine? Why do I need God to help me if I've got all the wisdom in my head and I can handle it everything myself? Okay? We don't. But it's when things get really complicated, is if God is actually, he's not trying to, just, I've even said, God, are you trying to kill me? No. He's trying to help me to lean on him. Do you know uh, the shepherd? Uh, I'll, I'll go get you. The good shepherd. Y'all see that? Y'all see that picture of the good shepherd carrying the sheep? Y'all seen the picture? <coughs> carrying sheep on his shoulders and it looks so cute. Guess what? You know why he's carrying it? Because you know why he's carrying it? The other, I'm talking when he carries it on his shoulder. Well, that was one of them too. But he got to have to carry it on his shoulders. Is because when sheep kept running away, when they couldn't keep the sheep, the sheep would keep running away and get in danger and a danger of wolves and danger of bears and lions and all kinds of things that were danger of getting lost and never being able to find their way back or drowning. And so uh, uh, there's something called, you mean, in the 23rd Psalm it says, He restores my soul. A sheep could eat and just keep on eating until he just, he just, he just fell over and he'd roll over in the seat of in the air and he couldn't move and his body on the inside would develop gas. And his body would literally, if, they, if he didn't get turned over in time enough, he would blow up. Blow up. Okay? Now, so when the shepherd came, he would take him, gently pick the sheep up and put him back on his feet. That was called restoring his soul. So, so we're all like that. We all get knocked off. We get knocked off, off balance. And we get full of, not just their gas, but we get full of all kinds of mess. And God comes and picks us up and puts us back on our feet. But that, that showed that. When, when a sheep kept running away and the shepherd couldn't keep him from running away, you know what he'd do? He'd go find him, listen carefully, and he would break his leg. And after he broke his leg, he would carry him on his shoulders until the leg healed. And that would teach the sheep not to run again. I don't know about you, but God broke my leg a few times. Spiritually. Spiritually, yes. Spiritually. He's broke my leg a few times because I kept running in the wrong direction. And the circumstances in my life went, stop. And I had to lean totally on God because I couldn't do it myself. And, and while I was healing, I realized, hey, God's got the answer. Now, Bethany, you had your hand raised? I forgot. Okay. Keep going. Okay. So, so, the question is, to everybody, and you ain't got the answer, because I know what the answer is, is God trying to get your attention? He's got mine. You know, every time I think, every time I think I know all the questions, every time I think, every time I think I know all the answers, guess what? The questions change. I'm telling you, the older I get, 
I used to think the older you get, how smart you can get. The older I get, I, honestly, I, I feel I feel right country boy dumb sometimes. You know what I'm saying? And I'm from the country. Ain't me in Possum Track. I understand you is. I used to think I was pretty intelligent, but the older I get, the less intelligent I feel because life gets more and more complicated, and and you got to stay on your toes. Any way you turn, you got to stay on your toes. So, so God, this is this, this, this. Here it goes. Here's breaking that sheep's leg. Sometimes it takes a painful situation to make us change our ways. God will allow pain not to destroy you, but to develop you. The Bible says in Proverbs 20 and 30, The blueness of a wound cleanses away evil, so do stripes the inner parts of the belly. There's times God allows things to happen. I'm telling you, a lot of people I know, if they hadn't gone through a crisis moment in their life, they would not be serving God now. Or they wouldn't be serious with God now if they hadn't gone through the crisis. I'm going to give you a few few, few scriptures. I'm going to... I, did, I know y'all don't have them to die tonight, so y'all can write these down. Jonah. Jonah chapter 1. Now, now I want you, Jonah, I, I like the book of Jonah. But Jonah, well, he had to have some Lenten blood in him. Jonah what chapter? Jonah chapter 1. He had to have some Lenten blood in him because he was hard-headed. They have everybody. <laughs> yeah. Uh, God told Jonah, who was a prophet, to arise and go to Nineveh. It was a couple hundred mile trip. Arise and go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it. Nineveh was one of the meanest kingdoms on this earth. Nineveh, when the, when the, when the, when when, when uh, uh, the Assyrians would come through, they would literally come through, and when they come through a city, they would take the guys, they would kill the guys, uh, they would. They would rape the women. They would take the kids back for slaves. And if you walk through the city, they would have they would take the people and they would literally the guys they would peel their skin inch okay. by inch off their Does body. Give nightmares to little ones. Okay, okay, I, I forgot we got. But this isn't this isn't children's church back here. Okay, so um, they just got really hurt. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here we go. They would they would there would be a, a there would be there would be a, a, a pyramids of skulls because the Syrians were so mean. The Ninevites were so mean. And so Jonah said, I don't want to go get in the repent. They're too mean. They're the meanest people I've ever known. I don't want to go talk to them. Has God ever asked you to talk to somebody you said they were too mean to talk to? Has God ever asked you to witness somebody and say, well, I don't want to witness them for. They're some of the meanest people I've ever met. Yeah, so, so Jonah... Had a couple hundred mile trip to go, but Jonah decides, instead of going, he says, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it. Verse 2, for the wickedness has come before me. But Jonah rose up to flee from Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa. Now, from here on out, every day he went down to Joppa. He found a ship going to Tarshish. He paid the fee thereof, and he went down into it. Go down and go with him unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. The Lord sent a great wind in the sea, and there was a mighty tempest, and the ship was about to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God and cast forth the what wares that were in the ship in the sea and lightened it. But Jonah was gone down. All, Jonah was going down, 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 trying to run from God. So he's going to, instead of going a couple of hundred mile trip, he's going to take a couple of thousand miles out of the way, but he winds up getting thrown off the boat and winds up being swallowed by a whale. Now, it's amazing to me that while he's in the belly of the whale, he caught it. He didn't caught it in the belly of the whale. You know what he called it? Big fish. No, I mean, I know that I'm, I'm going to talk about it, but uh, it is, big fish is what Jonah called it. I'm talking about, though, Jesus called it a whale. But Jonah called it a big fish. But I'm trying to say is, though, you know what Jonah called it? Jonah called it the belly of hell. It's possible that he even died while he was in the belly of the whale. It's stunk in there. It's stunk. <laughs> they, 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 they caught, they, they've had two guys in history that I've read about that were swallowed by either these humongous fish that can swallow men and men can live in them. And there's been two guys that have been pulled back out alive out of these fish uh, by whalers 
and by fishermen. And when they come out of this fish, they've been with that fish for a day or so. And when they come out to fish, their body is bleached from the from the stomach acids, and their clothes is literally eat off of them. So, so here's Jonah. He he's going through this experience. He called it the belly of hell. He goes down below the mountains. He comes back up and says, God, you know what? I messed up. I'll do it. I'm sorry. I messed up. I'll do it. And so God takes him in the fish, vomits him up right where he belonged. Okay? Um, I read somewhere that uh, one of the pagan gods of the Ninevites was fish. So if you're a Ninevite out there and you're you're fishing it in, here comes this big fish and they say, <laughs> and here's this prophet walks out. You don't listen to him. And not only that, but he's come out his, his body's bleached and yeah. his clothes are tore all up. Can you imagine? You're gonna listen to that guy. So, <laughs> so Jonah was going to think going a thousand miles out of the way to keep him doing what God told him to do because he didn't think that people were worthy to get what God had for him. I stopped that years ago. I quit that. Because I, I found myself being judgmental to people. I, they don't deserve what God's got for them. You know what? That's not my call. Because those people thought the same thing about me. Also, in the early church, in the book of Acts. Now, this is, this is cool. I want you to look at the book of Acts, chapter 1. Book of Acts, chapter 1. What verse? Verse 4. Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 1, verse 4. Now this is how God allows problems in your life to light the fire under you. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which was the day of Pentecost, which said, You've heard of me, for John truly baptized of water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. All right, now, uh, and, and of course, uh, and when they were there coming together, they asked him, Lord, when at this time will you restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said, It's not for you know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, there was a problem. He told them to go out. But you know what? All they want to do is keep a holy huddle in Jerusalem. So, because of that, God allowed great turmoil to come to the church. Paul was part of it. So Paul was part of tearing the church all to pieces, plus Paul was part of building it back together again. But, uh, in Acts chapter 8 it says, And Saul was consenting unto his death, talking about Stephen, and at that time there was a great persecution now that word persecution again is, is to be chased. It means to be, be hunted down against the church which was at Jerusalem and they were scattered abroad. Think about this word now. They were scattered abroad. Think about it. I want you to hear that word again. Scattered abroad. Think about it. It's called dispersia. All right? Now, uh, scattered abroad throughout the <laughs> regions of Judea and Samaria except for the apostles. Now, now, if you'll turn to James... James, chapter 1. First, I really like James because <laughs> James was the half-brother of Jesus. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. So James is the half-brother of Jesus, but he don't start bragging about I'm the half-brother of Jesus. He says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. One wow. Person. First one. One and one. To the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greedy. Again, that word scattered abroad is another form of this. It's called dispersio. And it means literally the scattering abroad of Christians among the world. So, because they wanted to have their little holy huddle, their little my for no more, God allowed all this great turmoil on them so they would have to branch out and have to make a difference. Like he told them to start with, I want you to make a difference everywhere. But they wouldn't go everywhere. They wouldn't hang around and huddle. And so he said, okay, I'll fix it. So sometimes you're thinking that, that God's allowing things on you to tear you down when actually he's actually building you up. You just don't see it. You don't see it at the time. But remember, hindsight's 2020. I can look back and say, oh, God was building me back then. God was doing something special with me. I didn't even understand it. I didn't see it. I hated it at the time. It hurt. But you know what? God 
uses problems to direct us. Ask Jonah, ask the apostles, even ask Paul. God uses problems to direct us. You can look all through the Bible and you can see how God always used problems to direct his people when they wouldn't listen any other way. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I don't want to listen any other way. I mean, am I the only one? Okay. It is cool stuff. It's good stuff. Number one, God uses problems to direct us. Number two, and then we're going to close after this. But we, you got, anybody got any questions about God using problems to direct us? Anybody got questions or comments? No, but I do remember what I was going to say. Okay, go ahead. I know the you all heard the phrase diamonds in the rough. Mm -hmm. Well, diamonds are actually made of coal with the pressure. So as much pressure as we go under, the more the diamonds shine. That's exactly right. That's good, girl. You did good. <laughs> That's right. Right now, I better be a big one. <laughs> That's right. The pressure, pressure, the pressure actually is good for you. You might not think so at the time. And you remember me telling you the story about the that they're down seven miles in the sea where no, nothing lives. Nothing can live. There's so much pressure. They noticed they they finally made a, a submarine that could go down and go down into the deepest parts of the, of the sea. And when they went down to the deepest parts of the sea with this robotic submarine, they discovered there was these little fish fly, fish. Uh, not flying around, but swimming around. And they said, how do these fish survive under this pressure, seven miles under the water? Can you imagine seven miles under the water, how much pressure you'd have? You would die. Okay? They said, how is this fish surviving? So they, they took the robot, went out and, and caught some of these fish, and they brought them in, and the biologist studied the, the little bitty fish to see why they could survive under so much pressure. And what they discovered was, on the inside of this fish was a little mechanism in it, a little organ, that actually produced pressure on the inside of it. So, when it, no matter how much pressure was pushed on the outside, the organ on the inside would correspond with equal, equal pressure on the inside. So according to that fish, it didn't feel any pressure at all. Because inside was pushing so hard that when the outside tried to collapse it, it couldn't because the inside kept it pushed out. I like to think about this. Greater is he that's in me, than he that's in the world. In this world you will have tribulation, you will have pressure, great pressure, but be of good cheer. He's already overcome the world. He's inside of me, and he's pushing. So, when, when something should normally crush you, it's not going to crush you because you got God. He's, he's, he's there. Any, any questions? Any, any comments? Anything? Mm -hmm. Alright, number, number two. Number two. God uses our, uses our problems to inspect us. This, 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 I don't, this, this is a hard one here. I, I really don't like to be inspected. Amen? How many like to feel like you're under the spotlight, under the test light? I don't like it. Amen? I just don't like it. How many like to be followed by a state patrolman for about five, six, seven, eight miles? No, it's bad. Yeah, it works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I hate it, man. I, I, you know, uh, 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 it, it's just, it just, it tears my nerves up. Well, one day, one day, uh, Beth and I were on the way to church, and 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 uh, I pulled out a possum track, and there's this car barely moving. So I go around the car. I was not speeding. I went around the car. I'm going down the road. Look behind me, and I see this Mustang coming up behind me. And I said, "That sure is a pretty car." I said, "Matter of fact, knows that pretty car." I said, "That looks like it might be the law." And he comes, and he goes just like this, and turns the blue lights on. And I said, I know he's not coming for me. What have I done? <laughs> and Bethany said, Dad, he's coming for you. So I pulled in. Out there by the fish farm, I pulled in. He pulls in behind me. And he starts walking to the car. And Bethany said, Bethany said, Dad, you're in trouble now. And I kept saying, that is the prettiest Mustang. <laughs> and I said, that is an awesome looking car. She said, Dad, you just got pulled. You heard about the Mustang. I said, listen, it's an awesome car, girl. Look at how pretty it is. And, and it actually was Russell Davenport. Russell Davenport cut the man said, said, said uh, he looked over at Bethany's side first and looked down. And I said, well, Bethany must have done something. He's coming after her. <laughs> That's what I told her. I said, it's you that want. <laughs> so, so, so now, Beth, so now, Bethany's, go, now Bethany's going. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And so, uh, and uh, Russell Davenport looks down, and I know Russell. I mean, he used to work with Daniel. And so, uh, uh, Russell said, how you doing, man? I said, I'm doing good. I said, what have I done? He said, nothing. <laughs> he said, the problem is, there's a car just like this that's selling drugs down here. And he said, when I saw you get move around another car, he said, I just, just got caught my attention. And so I went, to, I went to check you out to make sure you weren't that car. I said, I, didn't, I ain't selling anything. <laughs> I said, I'm giving, I'm giving away things, but I ain't selling anything. He said, I know, man. Go ahead. Just just, 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 just be careful. I said, okay, I'll be careful. So, uh, uh, oh, yeah, I see, I see that. And we're going to put a, I'm just, put a tray right down there. And when we get ready to leave, if you want to leave an offering, you can leave an offering right in that tray. If you want to leave an offering, that's a good place to put it. All right. So now, God uses problems to inspect you. People are like tea bags. How many's ever got? I remember going to Walmart or Walmart's food line. And food line, I was trying to save some money on my groceries. And I like good old Lipton tea. Lipton tea's good. Well, I saw this other brand that said just like Lipton tea. <laughs> and so I got it. I carried it home and my dogs wouldn't even drink it. It was pitiful. I poured it on the plants and the plants died. It was pitiful. But it said just like Lipton tea. But you know what? It was just like Lipton tea until what? Until I put it in hot water. Once I put it in hot water, their case fell apart. The same way. Look, we can talk about how strong we are. We can talk about how manly we are. You know, we can talk about, I'm going to take care of my family, or we talk about, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. But then let, then let the hot water come, and then see when the hot water's here. Then how are you going to handle everything? That, so, so, so when the hot water's on, that's when you know what's deep inside of you. And if you're going to stand or if you're going to drop, you're going to fall. So let me ask you a question. I, know it's God, I asked you a while ago, has God ever directed you with a problem? Let me ask you another one. Has God ever tested you with a problem? Uh, I can ask. I can make it bring it right down to earth. Are you sitting beside that test? <laughs> Are you sitting in front of that test? <laughs> I'm playing about that. I'm playing. All right. So when you <laughs> when, when, when you're going through the fire, when you're going through the fire, that's when you find out. You, you, that's when the inspection takes place. You know, uh, uh, Malachi, and, and I've told this so many times, I'm going to tell it again tonight. Malachi says, first of <laughs> James 1, 2, and 3, it says, When you have many kinds of troubles, you should be full of joy, because you know that these troubles test your faith, and they will give you patience. Test your faith and give you patience. Now, Malachi 3 and 3 says, He will set as a refiner and a purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi, and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. So let me, let me just say this. In Malachi, when it's talking about this, the way the refiner would do, the refiner would set by the melting pot. And he had a bellows. And he used the bellows, with, he could bellows with his hand, or he could bellows with his foot, and he would spin it with his hand if he needed it or a foot. What he would do is he'd put the gold or he'd put the silver in, and he would heat it up. And he would heat the gold up so hot that it would start bubbling. And when it started bubbling, he would take the fire away. And when the fire got away, he had a ladle, and the impurities would be at the top. And he'd scrape away the impurities and throw it away. Then he'd fire the fire back up again, and it would bubble. And then he would scrape off the impurities, and he would do it over and over and over again. You know when he would stop giving the fire to it? When he could see his reflection in the gold or the silver. So a lot of times when we're going through something, we're thinking, God, what are you trying to do to me? Well, you know what he's doing? He's trying to see his reflection in you. And so when you start responding to the problem that shows his glory instead of your own, or your own in lack of patience, that's when God gets to glory, and that's when God will turn the fire down. So, 1 Peter 1 and 7 says, They have come, to, they have come so that proven the genuineness uh, of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though it's refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. He lets us go through this fire. Zacharias uh, uh, 13 and 9 says, And I'll put 
this third into the fire and refine them as one refined silver and test them as gold is tested. They will call upon my name and I will answer them and I will say, these are my people. And they will say, the Lord is my God. And it's cool. You're thinking, I'm being burned up. No, you're not. God's actually doing something in you. Job, the person who went through the most of anybody that you see in the Bible, Job said, but he knows the way I take. When he has tried me, I shall come out as gold. Job said that. So, two things, and we're going to end it here with some questions and our comments. God uses problems to direct us, light a fire under us. God uses problems to inspect us. And it's the Job, Job 23 and 10. Job 23 and 10. So, so, I sit back and look back over my life and I think about the hard times and and with every hard time I've been through, all it did was I, I thought it was killing me at the time, but actually it 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 wound up being something great. I remember when I was working with Brother Hayslip in the internship program, I thought Brother Hayslip hated me because he did some hard stuff. I mean, he made it hard on me. He made it hard, hard. He told me later because he saw so much in me, he thought he do he had to make it hard so I'd be ready. Well, I sometimes I didn't want him to even see me because if he mentioned my name, I knew something was coming. <laughs> But you know what? After after I left the internship program and when I became a pastor, I called him up and thanked him and said, there's only one problem with you being so tough on me. He says, well, I said, you weren't tough enough. I said, because the real problems, the real problems are tougher than I ever imagined. And your toughness on me got me ready for them. But if you could have been a little tougher on me, I might have, I might have been a little more, a little more prepared for what was coming my way. So when you got tough times, remember, Tough times don't last, but tough people do. Anybody got any questions, comments? Next week we're going to do two more, one or two more, and then we're going to do the other one. Uh, but I want you to take this home and, and just think about it. Just think, you don't have to write anything down. I just want you to think about it. You don't have to. This is your homework, but it's personal homework. And here it is. I want you to answer that question. Is God trying to get my attention? And uh, has God tested my faith with a problem? That's two. That's two. I mean, that's two very powerful ones. And are we sitting in front of them? <laughs> yeah. They're going to that down. Okay. Question: Is God trying to get your attention? And just think about it. What's going on? See, this is going to help you understand better. Instead of thinking God's trying to get you. Now, if you think about it this way, you're thinking, wait a minute, God's trying to develop me. Number one, is God trying to get my attention? Is he trying to direct me with the problems? Number two, has God tested my faith with a problem? That's the part of inspection. Just think about it. I want you to think about it. I want you to, 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 to digest on it. And if you want to next week, you can say something if you would like, but you don't have to. But these right here, if you'll think about these these right here, this will make this whole series worth its weight in gold. Because you're understanding now, God's not trying to destroy me. God's trying to develop me. God's trying to make something special out of me. I keep, I keep going back to it. I go back to it all the time. But I remember D.C.'s football team lost one in two seasons, lost is either one game or two games in two seasons. And the reason I believe <coughs> that they only lost one or two games was not because they were bigger than anybody else, because there were some other teams that were much bigger. The reason they there's two reasons why. Number one, we cause we always let them practice harder than they play. Every practice we, we pushed them, I mean pushed them hard. And number two, we tried to keep them with a good attitude. So good attitude and pushing them harder and practicing when they play. So when they go to play the game, they actually didn't think they were playing as hard. They, they, they knew Tuesday night practice was going to be a lot harder than Saturday game. And Thursday night practice was going to be a whole lot harder than Saturday game. And uh, it developed teamwork. So that's cool. Anybody got any questions? Okay, let's pray. Father, I love you. I praise your name. I thank you for your grace and mercy. I thank you for this night. I thank you, God, that you do use problems for your benefit and for ours. 
I ask you to minister to us and through us, Father, and help us to think about these things and to realize that you are on our side and that you're pulling for us. And, Lord, I ask you right now, Lord, to help us come back next week to learn more about this and to keep on moving forward. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Don't forget Sunday morning. Sunday morning, I'm going to go to part two of Dear Lord, I Quit. I'm going to tell you how.